All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to NBC. This is the pre-show, so don't worry if you're not quite ready. Still got time to grab your tea, coffee, breakfast, whatever you need for the service this morning. But before we start, um, I just wanted to introduce Parveen, and I'm really excited to host with Parveen. It's her first time today, so we're gonna get to know her a bit before we start the service. Is that okay, Parveen? Oh, real? I'm so excited. <laughs> it's gonna be excited so to fun. Be here, but it's, nervous too. Oh yeah, you'll be great though. <laughs> okay. So, how did you get involved in NBC? How did you come to find us. Actually, it was through my daughter. She took uh, the Bible camps here over oh, the cool. few summers. And then one day just said to me, you know what? I really like this church, mom. We should try coming here. And so slowly, slowly, I would just keep coming and mm -hmm. coming. And then it kind of stuck. And Aww. then I got more involved. So right now I help to host the online Facebook when we do our online church. Oh, um, you know, I've taken Alpha. I've helped to do a couple of devotionals when uh, Dwayne was away yeah. a couple of months ago. So I've just slowly been getting more and more involved. That's awesome. And so cool that it came through your daughter and too. It came like, through my daughter. She just kept pushing, kept knocking on the door. She did. Yeah. She's the biggest influence on me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's great. So was that pre-COVID? It was pre-COVID. Yeah. Okay. So I had been coming to church yeah. prior to COVID. So you've, you've experienced the full in-person service. I have. So it probably has been more than a couple of years because COVID was a couple of years. Yeah. So it's probably three, four years now. Time just flies. Yeah. So what yeah. is like what's one thing that you're really looking forward to or missing from the in-person service? What are you going to be super excited to experience when we come back? Just seeing everybody else. Just, mm -hmm. you know what though, the interesting thing is uh, because we've done a lot of online work and, and with the Zoom church, I met a lot of new people. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to meet those yeah. people in person that I have never seen in person before. Yeah, well, it's it's so crazy. Even Christina who hosted last week for the first time, I I've seen her on Zoom calls over and over again for yeah. the last year. I thought I knew her and then I was like, I've never actually seen you in seen person, you in person before. It's yeah. crazy. So it'll be yeah. so great to have that connection. Yeah. And I'm sure my daughter's looking forward to the youth ministry yeah. and seeing what that's going to look like now. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I'm sure it'll be completely it's different. exciting times. Completely different. It is exciting. Yeah. Well, we've got an exciting service coming up too. So we're going to be back in just a moment and we'll see you soon for the start of the service. During the pandemic, it was difficult because I was a teacher and I found out that on Thursday I wasn't going back to school and that was a little bit trying and difficult, so I lost my job, basically. It had been about five years since I had returned to the church. I sat in my pew every Sunday and I thought to myself, there's something missing in my faith. I want more joy and I was looking for something more and that's when I was introduced to Alpha. I was part of the Alpha that shut down mid like during the pandemic, so we were midway through. And when they told me that they were going to continue on Zoom, I gotta be honest, I didn't think it was even possible. But, you know, God has a way of working through us and with us to make it meaningful. Even though we weren't together in the same room, we were able to build that relationship, continue to build the relationship and we saw lives transformed. Alpha has taught me to pray. It has taught me to put my relationship with Jesus first. I'm extremely grateful because all my blessings I'm aware of now and thankful for. My everyday life looks exactly the same as it did before Alpha, but the way that I see the world, it's as if my focus has changed and there's a lens that is over my life now that I see everything much more clearer and more in tune with where I'm supposed to be and what God wants of me.
Welcome, everybody. Good morning. And we're so excited you're here to join us for church this morning. Um, and I want to say good morning to everyone who's worshiping in person again this morning. For the third week in the row, we have people in the sanctuary and online. So welcome to all of you. We're so excited you're here. And we just want to encourage you to connect with us on social media. We're at NBC Church. You can find us on the website, on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all of that. We want to connect with you. Um, and I'm so excited to be hosting this morning with Parveen for the first time. Yay. Yay! She's here this morning to join us and to help lead us through our service, and it's going to be a fun time. Thanks, Leah. Uh, today we're going to be continuing to focus on the series of Figuring Out Faith, and we have Debbie Johnson who will be talking about, can we trust the Bible? Now, Leah, have you ever thought about um, how many people have actually had their hand in the Bible and how accurate it might be, mm. or even like all the translations and what may have been lost totally. along the way? It's just such an interesting concept, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Like. It can be so confusing once you do start to think about it. It's like, is this something I can trust? Are these things real? How do right. I know? It's There's definitely so many aspects to it that we maybe don't always think about. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm really excited to see what Debbie has to say. Yeah, me too. And I hope you're looking forward to it too. Bring your own questions, bring your own doubts. That's okay. That's what this series is all about. And we're going to enter into worship before we get into the message and this topic today. We're going to worship with good grace and a new song called If All I Had Was Christ. Such a beautiful song. I just encourage you to open your hands, open your heart and your minds to what this song has to say for us that we can be okay if all we had was Christ and nothing else, we will be okay. Let's join in worship this morning. People come together Strange as neighbors, our blood is one. Children of generations, of every nation, of kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil fix your eyes on this one truth god is madly in love with you take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes from
Days go on as the walls come down All creation, everything with breath Repeat the sound All his children, clean hands, pure hearts Good grace, good God, his name is Jesus Swing wide, all you can In this Figuring Out Faith series, we've already learned that it's okay, even desired, to ask questions. And so the question I got to try and answer today is, can we trust in the Bible? That's one question that led me to all sorts of questions and a whole pile of books and other reading. Can we rely on what the Bible says? What authority do we give the Bible in our lives? Does God still speak through texts, or is the Bible just filled with ancient writings that are rampant with patriarchy and condemnation and judgment and violence that we don't have to pay any attention to anymore? A Bible that is flawed in so many ways that we wonder why it's even considered scripture. Can't we just throw it out? Friends, I hope that you'll join me in exploring this question today about can we trust the Bible? And if I have one thing that I hope that you'll take away today, it is my prayer that as you engage with Scripture, as we discover a little bit more about what the Bible is about, that we will discover the hope and peace and the presence of Jesus, of God's love for us, that can literally change the trajectory of our lives. Can we trust the Bible? Join me in a few minutes, and we'll see if we can answer that together. If all I had was Christ, I'd have nothing to gain. All I have is Christ. I have everything His presence is enough He hides me in His wings He wraps me in His love And stirs my heart to sing My life is in
Wow, that was an awesome new song. Yeah. I just it just moved me. Oh, I love that one and we loved recording it and bringing it to the church this morning. Um, there's the one line in the bridge that says, "I've never known a love like this before. Jesus, you are the one I'm living for." And I think that's why we're compelled to to give and to give back to the community, give back to the church, get involved and share that love with other people, right? Cuz it's agree. it's a love and a presence that we can't even explain. We can't um, begin to understand. And we just need to share that with people. So we encourage you to give. Give what you're feeling today, whether it's your time, your money, your talents. You can head over to nbc.ca slash give and give there or find a spot where you want to volunteer. We've mm-hmm. got tons of teams coming up and we uh, we really appreciate anything we can do to show that love to other people in our own church community, but in the, in the greater community yeah. too, right? Imagining God building better lives, better families, a better branch, and we do. And when we come together and join forces, um, we can do that. Absolutely. And we'll talk a little bit later about all the new volunteer positions that are yes. coming up. Such exciting times. And don't forget about the food cupboard as well. If mm-hmm. you've got, you know, extra food and resources that you can share, that's also an important ministry as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So many ways that we can keep giving back and um, being the hands and feet of Jesus in the world today. Yeah. Well, you know what? We're going to hand it over to Debbie now to uh, bring us the message. But don't forget to, you know, take some notes for your Zoom church. Sit back, relax, and get inspired by Debbie's message about can we trust the Bible? Good morning. For those of you who may be wondering who I am, my name is Debbie Johnson. And as of July the 1st, I am officially, formally retired as a United Church minister. Catherine, I finally did it. (laughs) I served here with the North Bramley community for 11 years, and I continue to volunteer here occasionally. Can we trust the Bible? Isn't that just like a great question? Whether you are new to the faith or simply exploring your options, or you've been steeped in the Bible and faith and church and traditions for your lifetime— I imagine that we have all read or heard of a chapter or a verse and wondered, what in the world is that all about? Did that really happen? I mean, like Balaam, a talking talking donkey? (laughs) Jonah, swallowed up by a great big fish? And all those red letter words of Jesus, did he really say all that? Maybe you've heard some of the criticisms by people who claim to be agnostics or atheists or anti-theists, like Christopher Hitchens, when he wrote his book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. It was a bestseller, and he wrote this about the Bible, that it leads to religion that is violent, irrational, intolerant, invested in ignorance, and hostile to free inquiry. Whoa. I don't think he trusts the Bible at all. Can we trust the Bible? Is it written by God or is it inspired by God? Or are these just simply stories that are gathered over millennia? Is it filled with a bunch of ancient laws that with little to no relevance for our lives? There are so many questions and so little time this morning. So let me start us off with a little Bible 101 about what the Bible is and why I believe that no matter all the questions that I still have, that reading the Bible is the best way for us to learn about Jesus and from that, perhaps, make the decision to follow Him. Despite some lingering questions that I may never find answers for, I have come to trust that the Bible reveals a trustworthy, loving God and is our magnificent story of being chosen and loved. I'm going to encourage you now to put your questions in the chat. And on the Sunday that this service is being aired, I'm going to do my best to try and answer your questions or find some resources that can help you and and help you and encourage you to ask that question about can you trust the Bible? Well, let's start now with some FAQs about the Bible. Quoting Rob Bell in his book, What is the Bible? It's a library of books 
written by 40 or more authors, roughly over 1,500 years, not counting all of the years of the oral tradition of the exchanging of stories that has preceded it. The current English Bible, and this one is one of mine, that many Christians use has 66 separate books within it. It's divided into two main divisions. There's the Old Testament part, sometimes called the Hebrew Scriptures, and the New Testament part. So that's the bigger side on that side and the smaller side on that side. The Older Testament has 39 books. The Newer Testament has 27 Some Bibles also have something called the Apocrypha, which are 14 more books that were written around the time that the Bible was always all being compiled, but they didn't make the final cut, the canon, that the church declared was the final version of the Bible in and about the 5th century. There are also other ancient books called Gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas, but it too didn't make the final cut. The various books within these two testaments are compiled of narratives, of stories, of parables, of letters, of wisdom literature, of poetry, of worship songs, of wise sayings. There are the four Gospels, meaning good news, that are found in the New Testament alone, and they tell us the stories of Jesus' life. And then there are the Acts of the Apostles, which is the beginning of what we call the church, the spreading of the Jesus movement. Sometimes you may hear the Bible referred to as Holy Scripture. That's a term to describe writings that are considered sacred to a particular group of people. So the Quran is Scripture to the Muslims. The Torah, the first five books of the Older Testament, is scriptures to Jews. And for Christians, the whole of the Bible, the Older and the Newer Testament, are both considered scripture in its whole. Now here's a rapid-fire session about our FAQs. The Bible is the world's most printed and most sold non-fiction book. Yes, even more than Harry Potter. The Guinness Book of World Records estimates that there have been over 5 billion copies of the Bible sold. In 2020, the YouVersion app that you can download onto your phone, and which was created by Craig Rochelle's team at Life Church, featured 2,062 Bible versions in 1,372 different languages as well as over 800 Bible plans, which are simply ways to help us read through Scripture. The original languages of the Bible are Greek and Hebrew, and the first translation was into Latin. English didn't exist as a language when the Bible was being written and compiled. So all of our Bibles are translations of original scripts. I know, that's a lot of information to dive into. But after that quick Bible 101, and before I really dive into the answer about can we trust the Bible, I need to just share a quick story with you about what has shaped my views. Some of you know I came back to church when I was about 30 years old, seeking answers to some of the big questions of life. After an experience of what I now name as the Holy Spirit, I went up to the minister there and asked if I could take these new members' classes, and he said that yes, I could. But I had my follow-up question ready. I asked him, do I have to believe all those stories? And he said an answer that was so grace-filled. He said, no, Debbie, you don't have to believe all of those stories, but why don't you come and listen to them? And then you can make up your mind. From the very beginning of my faith journey, I learned that it was okay to ask questions. And I want to encourage you to do the same. As I began to read through the Bible those many years ago, I realized that the bigger question for me was not whether or not I believed in a virgin birth or whether the creation of the whole universe took place in six literal days, but that I could come to understand that factual or not, there was still meaning in those stories of teaching me something about God and that they were worthy of having some authority, 
some influence, impact in my life. I came to trust that the stories of Jesus revealed to me a loving, liberating God, even if I didn't fully understand what the word made flesh meant then. Theologian Brian McLaren, who's written a number of wonderful books that are also worth reading, he wrote one called, We Make the Road by Walking. And in it, he said this about the Gospels, those four books in the Newer Testament that talk about Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell the story of Jesus in ways similar to one another, which is why they're often called the synoptic Gospels with a similar optic or viewpoint. Many details differ, and the differences are quite fascinating. But it's clear the three compositions share common sources. The fourth gospel, the gospel according to John, tells the story quite differently. These differences might disturb people who don't understand that storytelling in the ancient world was driven less by a duty to convey true details accurately and more by a desire to proclaim true meaning powerfully. Let me say that again. Storytelling in the ancient world was driven less by a duty to convey true details accurately and more by a desire to proclaim true meaning powerfully. He says, in addition, The ancient editors who put the New Testament together let the differences stand as they were so each story can convey its intended meanings in its own unique ways. So yes, there are differences and in the details and in some of the stories, and those original writers knew that too, but they wanted each of their respective communities and those of us who are reading those stories now to wrestle with those differences, to struggle with the text, and come to our own conclusions in our own time. When we want to dive into verses we often need to learn more about the context in which they were written. And while most of us can't read Hebrew or Greek, it's often worth our while to at least Google what the English translation of a word is. For example, in the original King James Version, which of the English of the Bible, which was written in 1611, Paul, the Apostle Paul's famous 13th chapter of his letter, his first letter to the Corinthians, says this at the end, Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. The Greek word agape can be translated as love or charity, but in our time, we read those two words quite differently. It's like saying that the Montreal Canadiens are losers. Well, I mean, that's true. Tampa Bay won the Stanley Cup yet again. But I don't think we would call the Habs losers. I mean, they went farther than anybody ever expected them to. And in fact, they beat the Leafs in the very first round. Sorry. Is that too soon? (laughs) So as you dive into why one word or another, you can think, don't they know what they're doing and dismiss the Bible as unreliable? Or you can dive in and discover why using the word charity in that time had broader implications than it does in our time, just as the word losers does. But the amazing thing to me about the Bible is that you can still read a text without knowing any of that. And it can still change or enhance your understanding of the text as you dive into it. Sometimes we read the Bible and we get so bogged down in verses for which we have no understanding of context or meaning. I mean, why can't you mix wool with linen? And why can't you eat bacon? I mean, didn't Jesus say there was no unclean foods? 
But once we move out of the nitty-gritty, we can see that there are themes running through the Bible. A number of years ago, our friend Reverend Harold Percy came and delivered a talk called The Bible from 60,000 feet up. When we climb higher than the words on the page, we see this great arc of God's choosing to love and be involved in our lives. We see the themes of new life from death, forgiveness and new beginnings, healing and service, love and choice and presence, and so much more. We can see this arc of God restoring and renewing and reconciling the whole of creation through the power of love. In the beginning, we are chosen by love, and in the very last book of the Bible, it is revealed that God's place is here among us mortals. Friends, no matter where you are in your Bible reading, I pray that you don't lose the power and vision of that love that is transforming lives. When wondering whether we can trust the Bible, we can look at what it says. In 2 Timothy, we read, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Later on, the book of Hebrews says, For the word of God is alive and active, not just some dusty words written a long, long time ago, alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And in North Bramalee's own statement of belief about the Bible, we see, we believe the Bible is inspired by God and that God speaks to us through these words, stories, and promises today. We believe scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, that Wesleyan quadrilateral that we've talked about before, the quadrilateral, are all part of determining our community's directions and vitals and values. This is probably a good time to remember one of the foundational principles about North Bramalee's community. It is okay, even more than okay, to belong long before you believe. In my experience with our community, I would say that we range from people who believe that this is the literal word of God, not like in a Charlton Heston Ten Commandments kind of day, but a way that God has given these words to humans to record. For others, that it is inspired by God, that they listened and leaned into God and were able to write down these stories that we continue to read today. And for some, that it is just the human writings of people who encountered something that they were trying to make sense of and who they called God. And in the New Testament, that there are people who were firsthand witnesses, who were so changed by what they experienced through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that they had to tell others. Some of us have read the Bible. Some of us haven't. It's okay to belong before we believe. You probably already know that the Bible has been used to support opposite sides of arguments, like condoning slavery and fighting for abolition. It affirms that we are all loved and created in God's image and it's been used to condemn homosexuality. There are roots of anti-Semitism that is found in our Bible, particularly when we only bring our Christian lens to the reading, forgetting that Jesus was a Jew who was critiquing his own religion and its practices. Returning to Brian McLaren in another of his books called A Generous Orthodoxy, he writes, We must never underestimate our power to be wrong about talking about God, when thinking about God, when imagining God, whether in prose or in poetry. A generous orthodoxy, in contrast to the tense, narrow, or controlling orthodoxies of so much of Christian history, doesn't take itself too seriously. It is humble. It doesn't claim too much. It walks along with a limp. 
So friends, I ask you, how can you trust the Bible? I suppose at first we have to want to see if we can get a glimpse of God there on these printed words. I know the power of some of the words that are in there. When I am worn down by life and I read Jesus' invitation, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Or when I'm feeling so alone, to be reminded as he says, I am with you till the end of the age. And that brings peace and reassurance to me. Is the Bible a reliable source? Can you trust the Bible? You're going to have to make that decision yourself. There are people far more knowledgeable than I who have spent their lifetime studying Scripture, reflecting on God, and they still have questions. Sometimes I have to accept that the full meaning of a text will remain a mystery for me, no matter how much I try to study to get to the bottom of it. And at the same time, I will remain in awe that a text I have read over and over and over again will speak to me in a brand new way. In this quick little run through the Bible, I hope that I've encouraged you to answer that question about whether you can trust the Bible for yourself. I hope that I'm encouraging you to get engaged in Scripture, perhaps for the very first time, or to become more consistent with your reading. I just want to offer you some resources now as we come to a close that can help you dive into this question a little bit more on your own time. You might want to follow the morning or the evening devotionals on our North Bramley Facebook or Instagram pages, Or download any of the Bible reading plans, like Reading the Bible in One Year, led by Alpha founder Nikki Gumbel, or the Lectio 365 that is written by Pete Gregg and the 24-7 prayer team. If you're an old pro at reading, you might want to try a chronological Bible, which puts the Bible in historical or linear order to read, and it changes it up quite a bit. You might want to start looking at some commentaries like Caroline Lewis's commentary on the Gospel of John, or you could look at Willie James Jennings' Book of Acts. That is fascinating to me, written by a black theologian from the deep south of the United States and how he changes up for me what I see in that book. You might start following some scholars like Walter Brueggemann for Old Testament or N.T. Wright for New Testament. You might read both liberal and conservative writers, and you'll see the fun that they have talking to and about one another. (laughs) If reading the Bible is new and confusing, pick up a children's Bible. It's got lots of great pictures, and it's a wonderful starting place. And if you don't like reading, there are numerous apps, some of the ones that I've mentioned already, and others that you can just download. And if you don't like reading at all, they'll even speak to you and share the Bible for you. You might want to read more about Jesus by looking at Amy Jill Levine, who is a Jewish rabbi, as she talks about the Jewishness of Jesus that so many of us don't know about. Or start some Brian McLaren, who I quoted a couple of times this morning. You might want to leave the King James Version alone for a while. And look at the Message Version. Or the Good News. Or a Common English uh, translation. There are libraries of books written about this library of books. And on the pages of the Bible you are reading. My hope and prayer is that the, through the power of God's Holy Spirit, you will encounter Jesus and his love for you in life and in death and in life beyond death, in the midst of the worst and the best times of your life and our world's fortunes. And that as you experience those words leaping off alive off of the text, that maybe you'll be able to sing that song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus is the one who with great love asks us this question, 
do you love me? And when we reply, yes, he gives us these words. Then love one another as I have loved you. This is the Bible. And I love that those words are God's message for us. They inspire me. They ground me. And I hope they do you. Give it a try. Amen. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never felt me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle You have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence
promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your Oh, what a great message. What a great message and great song to end with. And I just love how Debbie had all those Bibles just sitting on the table there and could pull them all up and show us because there are so many different translations and different interpretations of the Bible. And, you know, I hope today that we all maybe we're actually leaving with more questions, which is okay Probably. because, you know, sometimes we need to be approached with a topic to realize that we even have questions and we can just keep investigating and going further and bring mm. those to things like Zoom Church and our small groups and talk amongst the tables at home with our families at dinner and just keep the questioning happening. We know that God calls us to question. It's okay, we're allowed mm. to do that and doubt, um, but let's keep talking about it and figure out what our beliefs are and what we want to believe. Um, so I hope you just keep taking that and keep investigating to figure it out for yourself. Yeah, that's well said, Leah. Yeah. I totally agree. Well, back to, you know, uh, talking about volunteer positions, as we promised, mm -hmm. we know that we, uh, you know, we want to live into the vision of coming back to live uh, in online and in-person services. So that brings about a lot more volunteer opportunities mm -hmm. for the community. So I've got a list here that I'm going to read out, but it's not the full list. You can go to oh, our yeah. website to check it out. Yeah, this is just the start. This, this is the <laughs> start. But they're pretty interesting titles. So I'm going to yeah. have to read them out. Uh, soundboard board operator, headphone monitor mixer. That sounds mm -hmm. interesting. <laughs> iPad operator, stage hand, broadcast mixer, broadcast broadcast mix assistant. <laughs> See, I'm even fumbling on my words. Lightning operator, slides controller, camera operator, and so much more. It just sounds so fascinating. I think an opportunity for the community with all kinds of skills and backgrounds absolutely. to come to church and share their skills. Yeah, and absolutely, their absolutely. And even if you don't necessarily have the skills, you're like, oh, could I do that? But it sounds intriguing mm. to you and interesting let us know. Like, we want to teach people how to do this. We don't expect you to be a professional. It is volunteer after all. So. Right. <laughs> but we just want to share in this and bring more people into it. And it is a lot of fun. Like, those roles, mm -hmm. they are exciting. They sound fun to, to me. <laughs> yeah, you get to learn something new and figure it out and try it out yeah. um, for something bigger than yourself. So check it out. There's way more opportunities. Even if you're not so into the tech realm, there's lots of other things up on the website. And uh, we want to encourage you to join us and serve in this way so we can keep bringing the gospel to more people. Um, so check that out for sure on our website. And thank you everybody for being here today. What a great time. So great to host with you, Parveen. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, it was so fun. And we hope you have an amazing week and join us next Sunday for a live from home service. We'll be live from home and Dwayne will be talking about do demons and miracles um, exist or are they real? Which is an interesting topic. Again, something you may not have realized you even had questions about, but for me, especially miracles, I'm like, you know, did they really happen? Do they happen today? It's totally a big question and we're gonna tackle it. So Sounds interesting yeah, to me. It's gonna be great. So hope yeah. you can join us and I hope you have an amazing week and stay connected with us throughout the entire week so that we can keep building onto this church community even beyond a Sunday morning. So have a blessed week. Bye everyone.